I want to welcome everybody to tie our TED Talks. If you're familiar with the TED Talk format, um, well, we, we, we kind of uh, pitched this idea to, to TED Talk, and they didn't pick us up, but Philly Bike Expo did, so thank you for having us. I don't know why they didn't think the world wanted to know about tires, bicycle tires in particular. And I, I could see that we probably have an arena audience out here that's way into tires, am I right? <laughs> so tires can be a real interesting part of every bike build. I think the most important part of every bike build because they do dictate what you can and can't do on that bicycle. Um, there are some people out there that are gifted with an extreme amount of skill that could probably do just about anything on a 700 by 23. Uh, but uh, for most of us out there, uh, we need to have especially because we're nerds, we've got to have specialized bikes for specialized terrain. Not made by specialized in particular, but you know what I mean. Um, so uh, we're going to start off, I'm going to give a brief uh, history of tires. Uh, I'll keep that brief. And then we have uh, two, uh, we have two, what do, should we call you? Engi we're going to call you faux engineers. They're not, engi not real engineers, but today, tire engineers, OK, from WTB and Schwalbe. This, I, I, don't, I don't know anyone's last name. We have all introduced yourselves. I'm Andrew Betzer. I'm the technical specialist at Schwalbe. Yeah, and I'm Nathan Swanson. I, uh, I just work in the sales department at uh, WTB. So tire engineers. Um, <laughs> those are jokes, supposed to laugh at them. All right. <laughs> um, so, uh, and for those, I am uh, uh, Ronaldo Romance, um, and I will be the moderator. Okay, <clears throat> intro. Uh, so, for those of you uh, who know modern tires today, you know them as uh, uh, essentially a uh, rubber with air in the middle, right? Uh, hooked onto a, or if we're not talking about tubulars, uh, with a, a, a bead and a hook, and that's how they stay on the rim. And you inflate a tire or squirt some uh, sealant in there and, and inflate, and you have a perfectly wonderful functioning, if they're at the right PSI, uh, tire and rim combination. Well, uh, prior to the turn of the century, the 1900s I'm talking about, tires were a solid piece of rubber. There was no air on the inside. You call tires with air on the inside, that's called a pneumatic tire. That was invented by Dunlap. I forgot his first name, but you all know Dunlap tires from car tires. Well, Dunlap started off as a bicycle tire manufacturer, what a lot of people don't know. Uh, and uh, he was the first one to use the pneumatic tire, like, a, like an automobile tire, later on, uh, where there was air inside the chamber and the tire would inflate and you could run a lower pressure, and these were tubulars at, a t at the time, you could run a lower tire pressure and have a nice comfy ride. And if you all remember uh, seeing photos of 100, 150 years ago, the roads weren't paved. They were riding exactly what we are all looking to ride today, which is that premium gravel, right? Because everything was premium gravel back then. So they had to have gravel tires. We're going to throw that term around. So um, these tires were probably around 42 millimeters wide, anywhere from that to 55 millimeters wide on wooden rims. They were extremely well made by hand. Uh, they were vulcanized also, which was a new um, something new that was introduced by Dunlap. He was really on top of his game. So these tires were beautiful. And as uh, road racing became more and more of a uh, paved circus, you have uh, less and less self-reliance in the Tour de France and other Grand Tours. Uh, the tires get skinnier and skinnier. You have support cars that are replacing whenever you get a flat. Um, we, we had a lot of uh, pseudoscience out there that was based mostly on, uh, on what you perceived, like your perception of speed, where we're running. We go from tires that were, uh, you know, 700 by 32 to 30 to 28 to 23. Then all of a sudden the pros are riding 700 by 20, pumped up to 160 PSI, which is insane. And I've, uh, some people in this room have definitely been there. I have been there. I wouldn't buy a tire if it wasn't inflated to 160 p. If it can't handle that, I'm not riding it. Okay, so uh, you get on a, if anyone's ridden one of those tires, you get on a road surface if it's even remotely chip and seal, and it's just like, it's like being on ice skates. 
but that was fast, felt fast, right? And what a lot of uh, more recent research has found, and as you see in Pro Tour Cycling, a lot of riders are now at least riding 28s, and that's like a race uh, specific tire at this point. So it has come leaps and bounds in that way, but it's all been pushed by the mountain bike. And the mountain bike tires have gotten fatter and fatter, larger and larger volume, low, running them at lower and lower pressures because of tubeless. You don't have to worry about pinch flats or anything like that anymore, which is pretty cool. And so we're able to take advantage of these more um, flexible sidewalls and lighter casings and tire technology uh, while running them at a low pressure. So we're getting a huge contact patch on the dirt or pavement or gravel. Um, we're finding that that isn't slower, like having low pr tire pressure. You don't need 160 to go fast. That speed that we were feeling was just the road buzz. And the lower PSI, fatter tire actually is faster. And so this is some pretty cool, um, kind of, pr you know, pretty cool analog technology that I'm really excited, excited about in bicycles because this isn't something that, this is something that will make you faster that doesn't rely on your bike having some crazy suspension design. Uh, it doesn't need to be made out of some space age material. It doesn't need to, um, it doesn't need to have a motor inside of it. All you need to do is change the tires and inflate them properly and you have a faster bike. So that's where we are today. Um, so from there, we're gonna go and ask our engineers, it's a joke, that's a funny joke. They're not engineers. Uh, I'll say it again. Uh, we're tire nerds. <laughs> tire nerds. <laughs> uh, we're gonna ask our tire nerds some questions here and we have some examples. We have some, a slideshow that we're gonna show you and then we have some actual physical examples to pass around and, and hopefully drive through some points and then if you have any questions, keep them in mind and we'll go through them towards the end. Sound good? All right, all right. Well, let's start off with, is everyone here uh, familiar with thread count, TPI? If you don't know about thread count, you better start counting. That's what I always say. Uh, <laughs> a, low, a low TPI would be considered anything from like the cheapest tires are like 30. And picture, uh, picture Egyptian cotton, your bed sheets. That's 800 TPI. That's good stuff, okay? Unfortunately, they don't make tires with a thread count that high. I, they probably wouldn't work. But picture it like that. A, a higher thread count is gonna be more flexible, and, but there are some downsides. It's gonna be lighter too. So guys, uh, high TPI, pros and cons? Yeah. Um, Here, I'll give the microphone. Come up to, yeah. oops. There we go. Yeah, I would say, um, kind of the differences between the two is going to be the easy way is like the structure and how uh, supple the tires can actually feel. Uh, for us, like we've kind of found, you know, for the tires that we make, we kind of set that middle ground of 60 TPI. We don't have many tires that are going to be in that 120. Uh, you know, we find that the ride quality is going to be the best for like the conditions that our tires are designed for. Because um, some of the downsides of like a 120. It's just going to be harder to hold air, um, maybe not as rugged and durable. Being that we have such a background in like dirt riding, a lot of our tires are designed more in the kind of that realm. So um, that's where we kind of sit. Do you want to uh, bring the slide up? What's yeah. That? So uh, so we do have a slide here that just shows essentially what we're talking about visually in terms of uh, the carcass construction of a tire. So here in the slide, three different carcass constructions. This is the underlying material that a tire is really made out of. Uh, in, the, in the construction process of a tire, basically you would run uh, rubber is laid over the top of these materials, laid together into the tire, baked, for uh, lack of a better term, in a mold, vulcanized, and then you have a, a complete tire. So depending on what you're using for uh, different carcass materials, the difference is, the biggest difference, is the coarseness or the thickness of the individual fibers. So. Here we have three different fibers. Um, what Nathan was talking about is, would be this higher end, the 67. Much thinner, um, going down to a 24 thread count, which is a really rudimentary tire, really inexpensive to make. Now the biggest difference between these three in terms of functionally is the durability. When you go low, down to this 24, you have a tire that is very, very durable, very hard to cut, but contrarily, 
extremely slow rolling and with terrible ride characteristics. So terrible, terrible ride characteristics. Really like terrible. you may as well be riding solid rubber at this point. But there is a there is a purpose to this uh, down this far end. The this guy um, and it's that if you want to make a tire cheaply that's incredibly durable you can do it and there are benefits to it for things like bike park for riding downhill and stuff like that and we do a couple of tires like that at Schwalbe which are cheap nasty hate set but excellent for that sort of use coming up to here um, and I'm sure Nathan would agree with me on this the 60 ish three count is the sweet spot there's really no argument in the industry about that uh, you're talking about uh, excellent performance, really good durability, and not really much of a trade-off in terms of performance. Uh, there are a lot of brands that do 120, 120, we do a 127 thread count at Schwalbe. There is a minor in enhancement in performance, but a, a large loss in durability. So if you're talking a, a 120 thread count tire, you're talking a race tire. The trade-off in terms of durability for off-road riding is huge. Um, in the past, let's talk about mountain bikes for a second, if we're talking uh, cross-country mountain biking, which I know a lot of people are familiar with uh, from the 90s and 2000s. Um, we used 120 thread count tires for racing. These days, pros are generally using this guy, the 60 thread count, at World Cup level. So what once was the middle ground in terms of the balance with performance, bikes have become so capable. This middle ground that most people have been using is is the status quo even at a pro level for, for mountain bikes now. So that's, that's TPI in a nutshell at least. Thank you. I'll come in the middle, that'll be a little better. <clears throat> so uh, uh, to add to that also though, 120 TPI, maybe you'll save 30 to 50 grams perhaps, if you're counting on a mountain bike tire. Yeah, so, yeah, minor weight savings. I like to ride 120 only just for a status. It's like a status symbol. So, yeah, you could keep that 60. That's for poppers. <laughs> um, I, I've, uh, I've, I jumped ahead on the casing. Do you want to, should we start right from the beginning of the slide, of the slideshow, if we go back to slide one? Yeah, if we, we kind of put together just to kind of do, to, to a lot of folks here, this is a lot of this is going to be kind of review, but this kind of allows us to kind of do a breakdown of what, like what tires are out there, what are the categories, sizes, and whatnot. So, um, yeah, I think the best place to kind of start is you know what are the what are the sizes and what are the tire options out there. Uh, you know, throughout the years, like this is we're you're, we're starting to see a lot of additions and say like the road category in, in general, you're seeing a lot different widths, you're seeing different diameters. Um, so this is a great example, you know, now kind of looking at road being that 23 to 32. Uh, recently, uh, Road Plus has been added into the mix of this, uh, and we'll show some pictures next, but um, you know, you have gravel, cyclocross is kind of like that crossover between the two, you know, and then mountain bike kind of has like that whole realm, so. Um, Anything you want to say there? No. Um, kind of a fun one to look at is, and we're starting to see this more and more, is this is kind of fun. Uh, like the whole idea of Road Plus and the invention of that was, you know, nothing, nothing brand new. The rim size already existed. Um, but what you get with like a Road Plus uh, 650 by 47 is the same outer diameter as that 700 by 30 tire. Um, it's pretty fun now because I think it was probably 2014-ish, I think is when like the Road Plus, you know, became a thing. Back then there wasn't many frame manufacturers that could actually hold that. Um, but what we're now seeing with so many manufacturers is that you can fit that Road Plus or the 700 uh, and kind of have two options to play with. So the same bike can do, do two different things and, you know, we see uh, folks go into races that are actually bring two different wheel sets. Um, as you can see in the picture here, it also works a mountain bike, where a said 27 plus tire would be the, pretty much the same outside diameter 
as now these are the same size. At the same time. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> but again, kind of you know you can have two options within one bike. So do you want to talk to the next one? I mean, I'll, I'm going to preface anything we talk about with tire size with, with one thing. Uh, the most important thing in tire size is what are you going to have the most fun on. That, that's basically it to me. There, is, there really is nothing else. And uh, Nathan's point about the, the tire size, personally, I run a, a 650 by a 50. So um, in, in nerd speak, I'd be calling that a 5584 size, the international standard size. Um, why, do, why? Why would you run that? Uh, and the biggest question that everyone asks, what's the trade-off? Why, why would I be going to a wider tire when I know that it's going to be slower? Well, let's talk about that for a second. If you're talking about the comparison that Nathan has here on the left with the 650 by 47 versus a 700 by 30 C, the rolling resistance of this tire on the left, the bigger tire, it is possible to make this tire faster rolling than the tire on the right, the narrower tire, in terms of just the inherent uh, energy that the tire loses rolling. The downside of the wider, tire, the wider tire is the aerodynamic penalty that you get pushing that wider tire through the air. And a lot of people think that's going to be huge. But that's actually at a fairly high speed. So the wider tire starts to lose performance comparatively versus the narrow tire at around 20 miles an hour. So it becomes a really big deal at that point. For most people, they're not pushing 20 mile an hour average speeds. I mean, I'm sure there's people in this room who make 20 miles an hour look <laughs> damn slow. I'm not one of them, but congratulations to anyone that is. Only with 120 TPI. With 120. Yeah, okay. Don't try it with 60. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so I guess the take home there is you can have the same performance in a more comfortable tire that has more grip, that is more fun to ride. Um, so. Yeah, the, the, other, the other downside we, we should touch on a little bit is going to the, the bigger tyres, there is a weight penalty. So a bigger tyre does have a weight penalty to it, which can mean that you know for climbing, the narrower tyre is going to have a bit of an advantage. For flatland, for off-road, the wider tyres just these days, there, there's just not a lot of data to support going narrow. And we see that in the gravel lineup. You know, we started Schwabi at sort of the 35 and the 38s. And we're seeing as things get more and more rugged and bikes get more capable, we're pushing that up to the sort of the two inch mark, the 1.75 inch mark, which uh, WTB does really well in the uh, 650 by 47, for instance. And uh, sky's the limit, but yeah, in that sort of one and a half to two inch range, the, there's just a world of possibilities in, in every category of gravel and road riding right now. So. Yeah, my personal favorite also, 650 by 47, 48 to 50. Uh, what I find interesting now is the stuff that I grew up mountain biking around, especially around New England, is mostly class four roads. You know, we didn't have too much single track and most of it was made for hiking. And so now as, this, uh, as people are having fatter tires on their drop bar bikes, you're able to link together all of these old trails and class four roads and make it into like a really cool ride. And I think back of what we were riding in the 90s, it was uh, 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 you know, something that's probably a, right about the same width, but a 26. So it's a, a, a much less capable tire and we weren't running tubeless, so we were pumping it up to 40 PSI so that we didn't get flat pinch flats. And so when, you, when I think about what was mountain biking and when, when mountain biking was actually, I'm gonna offend mountain bikers in here, but when, what, when mountain biking was actually cool and not just riding a motorcycle without an engine, we were riding essentially what is now the modern gravel bike. And so we have these beautifully capable tires now that come in all these different casings, sidewalls and treads, and we have tubeless, we have beautiful drop bar frames that fit the tires. Uh, the sky's the limit, really. It's, it's such. There's no. There's no. Um, no surprise that it's such a. That it's the fastest growing category. If you don't take into consideration e-bikes, uh, it's. Uh, it's really. If 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 you haven't tried them, uh, 650 by about 50. I really, really would recommend it. It's just like the golden age of mountain biking all over again. Next slide. Yeah. So this kind of touches again on what like Andrew was saying. Uh, you know, a good thing to kind of think about is, uh, you know, the contact patch and how much traction you're actually going to get and, again, how much drag is going to be created within that. So, you know, this is a, kind of shows a, a quick example of, you know, like a 29er versus a 27. 
Uh, other things to kind of think about, uh, you know, when the 29er first came out, this was a bigger deal uh, when you're going from like a 26 to a 29 was the angle that that tire would go, say, over a rock or that stick or whatever that was. And, you know, from a 26 to a 29, that, that rollover was a lot smoother. And, you know, from now with 27 and 29 kind of being the prevalent in that, it's not as much of a difference uh, as it was when it was 26 versus 29, but it's still something to think about. And then the other thing, you know, with the smaller wheel, you know, we kind of talked about this, you know, with weight and things like that, but it's also like the rotational weight and how much it is to get that, you know, that wheel moving. You know, the nice thing about a 29er is once you do get that thing moving, the momentum is easier to kind of hold within that, so. Yeah, I mean, we, I think these days we are, uh, let's not get too much into 27.5 versus 29, because uh, these days I think maybe the industry's a little spoken a little bit in terms of, for mountain biking at least, uh, 29, and yeah, there's, there's arguments for the fun factor and things like that, and everyone's going to have their own preference. In terms of the physics of a, of a 27.5 versus a 29, it's, it's pretty simple Newtonian physics in terms of going over an obstacle that we have right here. There's an amount of force that it takes for a tire to roll over an obstacle. Force equals mass times acceleration, that's a, whatever, 10th grade physics. A bigger tire, the amount of acceleration that the bike and the wheel has to go through is lower because it's over a further distance. So the amount of force that it takes is, is less on a 29er. Um, so yes, they roll better over obstacles, they have a larger contact patch and they grip better. The fun factor, well I don't really want to get into that one because there will be some people that try to shoot me afterwards, but uh, yeah, personally 29ers have certainly come of age off-road and they work great. So from an industry point of view, yeah, everyone, everyone can sort of see that pretty, pretty clearly from a downhill World Cup point of view right down to bikes that you might see at Walmart with 29 inch wheels on them now. It's pretty ubiquitous with uh, mountain bikes these days. Um, personally, I still ride a 27.5 if you're wondering. But. <laughs> May I ask what the downside of riding, say, a 29, something that large on a gravel bike would be? Uh, very little, really. Um, again, what, what I was touching on earlier with the aerodynamic penalty, bigger tires certainly do have a slight aerodynamic penalty to them. Um, and a weight penalty going to a, a larger tyre, there is certainly um, not a huge, but a significant, not an insignificant, I should say, weight difference between a 29er and a 27.5 or a 26. The rolling performance, the rolling resistance created, I don't want to get too deep into why inherently a, a 29er rolls um, on a flat surface with more efficiency than a, than a 27 and a half or a 26. There is one, and it's to do with how much the rubber actually has to flex and the casing has to flex. The best way to describe it in a nutshell is if you imagine folding something, let's say a piece of wood, it takes energy. The less you fold it, the less energy it takes. With a 29er, you're not folding as much. With a 26, you have to fold more. There's a more acute angle that the casing of the tire goes through. So smaller tires inherently create more rolling resistance. There is no way around that. There's no way to cheat in the industry. The only thing we have is technology, rubber compound advancements. Tubeless, where you're taking away the rubber, essentially from the tube, makes tires go faster. For gravel use, uh, handling really is it. Why you would choose a 27.5 over a, over a 700C. Um, and that's you know suspension design and, and mountain bikes and gravel bikes, we're just talking straight up geometry. Um, which I'm, I don't want to be the one to talk about. There's a lot of people downstairs who could talk <laughs> circles around me on that. But needless to say, it's, it's a bit easier to make a 27.5 handle nicely off-road than it is to make uh, a larger diameter um, uh, 29er or 700 C wheel handle nicely in the sort of gravel category, you know, drop bar bikes. Much easier to make a long mountain bike and a 29er that works well rather than a you know, slightly shorter gravel bike that handles well, but again, not, not quite my area of expertise. <laughs> yeah, that was perfect. Now, <laughs> the, uh, I often get asked the question, uh, people have their uh, 700, uh, we'll, we'll talk again about gravel bikes because I do feel like that's the OG mountain bike essentially. 
where you're not taking suspension into the into consideration. You are just dealing with what you're given with your wheels and tires, essentially. That's your suspension and, of course, your body. But, yeah, it's very hard to, to make a bike that handles still well, like snappy and fast, like you want a road bike to feel when it's on the road. And there's a reason for that. The reason why roadies still ride the 700 by, you know, 23 to 28 is because that's the that's the wheel size. That's like the magic number that just feels right. It's easy to build a bike around uh, in a number of sizes, and it's not going to feel sluggish. It's still going to feel the wheels are still going to spin up quickly, and uh, it just ends up being a really magic number. And as we saw with the examples with the tires uh, between the 700 by 30 and the 650 by 48, they are the same effective outside diameter. So you're getting all that extra cush, but still keeping the riding characteristics of a smaller wheel. So uh, I think there's a, a lot of benefit in that. Yeah, I don't have like too much to uh, add to that. I, you know, the thing that I like to say, you know, when you have folks that are looking to pick what size tire I should be riding on a gravel race or gravel ride is, you know, there's the different type of riders out there. There's the folks out there that are racing, uh, then there's the other ones that are looking just to finish. Uh, you know, the finishers uh, that just are out there to try to achieve 100 miles, 150 miles, 200 miles, it might be more important for them to have that, that comfort side and they're not looking for the lightest, fastest tire out there, but they want to actually be able to survive a 200 mile ride. So, you know, for everybody, everybody can have an opinion, um, but I really do think that it's fun to kind of be able to, you know, look, educate yourself, educate others on, you know, what is the pros and cons of each side and what is that rider or what are you as a rider looking to achieve there? So, um, yeah. Oh, we already went, oh, oh, we did casing, oh, puncture protection. That's always fun, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so puncture protection, uh, obviously there's a lot of different, uh, a lot of different uses for whatever you're gonna be using that particular bike for a tire, whether it be commuting or, or you know, doing a 100 mile road race. Uh, there's a lot of in-betweens there. Uh, and that's where puncture protection comes in. Uh, are you riding in an urban environment where there's a lot of stuff that's gonna puncture through the top of the tire or are you riding in a, like a, a rocky off-road dirt environment where most of your punctures are gonna be on the sidewall from other uh, organic matter? Um, so that's my introduction for casing puncture protection. What do you guys think? I'll let him talk. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, actually I'm doing a bit of a different one here. Uh, just to show our hands, I'm going to offer three categories. Uh, those who are pathologically afraid of flats and will cry themselves to sleep at night thinking about them. Those who don't mind getting one or two a year and those who uh, don't mind getting as many flats as it takes to have ultimate performance grip. Everything but flat protection. So the first there, pathologically afraid of flats. Okay, it's okay, it's not okay. as many as I expected, I but yeah, I, like, I, like, uh, I like that. Let's go the other way. Those people who really just want performance, utmost. Okay, okay. and that uh, that middle group. <laughs> I think that speaks volumes. So uh, that first group, the pathologically afraid of flats, pneumatic tires aren't really for you. Let's just <laughs> let's just say that it, it's so. This guy here on the right. This is something that Schwalbe has work, worked on now, it, it's an airless tire. And I think that's a swear word, honestly. Um, and I, I think Nathan would probably agree, airless tires kind of is a bit of a swear word. They have their place, um, but you're giving up a lot. Pneumatic tires have incredibly good uh, air. Nitrogen, for the most part, has great ride characteristics and it's an air cushion. We can all appreciate what that means. Um, is this, an, is this an airless tire that you guys are doing right now? Yes, this one on the right, we're not offering in North America right now. It's uh, popular for us in Europe, the Netherlands, the UK. Essentially that white thing you see in the middle is the same stuff that the sole of a shoe is made out of. So that's the best way to describe it. Um, on the right hand, on the, sorry, the far left hand side there, we've got, if I want to talk about puncture protection, kinds of uh, two ways to really stop a flat. There's the sledgehammer way, and the sledgehammer way is you just make the tire damn thick. 
Nothing's going to get through it if it's thick enough. And you know, us, Schwawi, and a number of other brands make tyres which are excellent that way. We use a latex belt under the tread. It's thick. It's just about a quarter of an inch. That stops basically anything, thumbtack included. There are trade-offs for that. They're super heavy. The rolling performance is okay. It's not amazing. Um, it's good, but uh, the ride quality is in the middle here we have a sort of a more technological approach which is using a thin tyre and then using technologically advanced fabrics. So the obvious one that people talk about is Kevlar, that's old school, we've, we've sort of gone past that now we're talking about, um, you know in layman's terms, ballistic nylons, polyaramid fibres which you would know in terms of um, like Vectran for instance and a lot of other unnamed technological fabrics which are Keep a tyre rolling nice and fast, nice and supple, but uh, offer good cut and puncture protection from sharp objects. So for the most part, you middle ground people who, uh, you can choose either the one in the middle or the one on the left. If you're a little bit more towards that pathologically afraid of flats, maybe towards the left. If you're uh, towards like the, I want more performance, the one in the middle. Do you have a quick question? Yeah, do you have a question then? We, we use a different system than, than something like a Tannis, so... Yeah, but that was just, what was the cost of that, and when will it be in the US? We're actually not even, at this point, looking at bringing it into the US, and the reason is, this is a, the one on the right that we're doing is uh, an entirely proprietary system. It works on any rim, but it requires specialised equipment. It's like installing a motorcycle tyre. We have to compress that uh, centre white foam, uh, gets put on mechanically, you, there's no way to do it by hand, once it's on there it has to be cut off. But you know, you're good for six to ten thousand miles on something like this, it essentially works like a, let's talk about say a... Um, and then you throw the wheel away? No, you just, just, cut, just cut it off with a pair of side cutters or something like that, you know, you can cut it off in a couple of minutes. But it works like, say you have a, uh, a 700 by 35C, it would feel like riding that at about 50 psi, and the rolling performance isn't too far down on a pneumatic tyre, but certainly it is inferior. Um, but you know, for bike shares, for people that are, like I say, pathologically afraid of flats, there is a, a room on the market for stuff like this, and it, as you mentioned, brands like Tannis um, do decent business from those uh, sort of riders. So, yeah. So at WTB, we. Uh, we're not like Schwabe. Like they, you guys do such a great job when it comes to protection. Uh, our our system is a little bit simpler. Uh, we offer like a light casing, you know, single ply tire. We also offer a tough tire, which is just a double casing. So, you know, that's that's going to give you that that protection. You know, the tough is going to be, you know, is going to be a, a heavier tire, uh, but it is going to give you a lot more structure within that tire, and uh, you know that protection. Um, Something that we have been adding to some of our lighter casing tires, as you can see in the red, is like a slash guard, like that nylon that uh, Andrew was talking about, just to, so that you're still allowed to have uh, a light tire, but do have some sidewall protection just from the rocks and things like that. Um, being on this slide, I think it'd be a good time to kind of talk about durometer. Uh, and just mostly because the graph, the, these pictures kind of show the different things that we are able to do with our tire. Um, uh, with our gravel tires and road tires, we're, we only use a, a dual compound, so you're gonna have a lower durometer underneath. It's usually a little bit harder, and then our, the durometer rubber on the top is gonna be a lot softer and have a lot more grip. So within our mountain bike tires, we're able to do a triple compound which it, well, you'll see as the yellow, and that's going to be our hardest durometer, which kind of gives a skeleton and uh, the structure to the actual uh, lugs. And then, like where the, you'll see the blue, we tend to put, you know, kind of a middle ground uh, durometer that rolls really fast, but it still has some traction and stick to it. And then usually where the green you'll see is going to be the softest. So. Um, I'll let Andrew speak to you know what they, those guys do, but you know we just offer a fast rolling tire and we offer a high grip tire. Um, kind of the fun thing to kind of think about with durometer is you know the softer it is, you know the more it's going to absorb. 
it's going to grip, um, but it's going to slow you down just a little bit. Whereas like the harder durometer is going to be a lot faster moving. Uh, it's going to it's going to last a little bit longer, but it's not going to stick as well. So. Yeah, and uh, no, actually, let's start with Christian. Uh, yeah, I was wondering, is the, the, the progress in tubeless technology going to render all of that irrelevant in a few years? From, and this is just my personal opinion, I, I would say no. And the, the reason I say no is I, at the moment, tubeless technology really relies on sealant. So in, in motorcycles and, and vehicles that have several hundred horsepower, Essentially, you can just make a tire thick, and uh, compared to bicycle tires, we're talking exponentially more rolling resistance in, in a, ve in a you know, motorized vehicle tire. Um, but with those thick motorized vehicle tires, you don't require a sealant. They just they'll just hold air, and we all know what it's like on our on our cars or our trucks. We don't inflate the tires very often. The mechanic might do it for us. On bicycles, when we're you know, the most powerful people here are probably pushing a third of a horsepower, you know, 250 watts. Um, it's just not acceptable to have a tire that would use 200 of those watts to, to push you along. So um, we rely on sealant to maintain the tire being really lightweight and really thin. And there has been a time where we went the other way and it was UST mountain bike tires where the inside of the tire literally had a, essentially a piece of tube vulcanized on the inside of it. They rode terribly, they were hard to install, and they were heavy as hell. So sealant's changed that game completely. The problem with sealant is, at the moment, there's nothing really on the horizon for putting a sealant in a tire and for it to work perfectly indefinitely. We've had companies try. There's companies on the market making sealants which uh, don't dry up. And sealants work really in, in one way, uh, immediately when you get a cut, and I would just call it the beaver dam effect. You cut a hole in the tire, You've got some particles that are suspended in a liquid. They all rush into the hole. All those particles jam together. And then you beaver dam a hole. Your puncture is essentially sealed. You keep riding. Now, uh, not to name names here, but uh, the, the sealants that, we're mo that are most commonly used for you know, our tires, and, and actually WDB, I'll speak for you on this one, because it's I think you use the same sealant as we do. Um, it's a latex-based sealant, so you get that beaver dam effect, and in a fairly short period of time, the latex component in that sealant cures, and you have a solid rubber plug in the tire, which is permanently fixed. The sealants which don't have that latex component don't ever technically uh, fully heal or fix the tire so it's airtight. You've always got some of that liquid carrying agent seeping through those holes. So in terms of what seals best, my personal opinion is that a latex sealant is best, but it dries up over time. So to answer your question in a nutshell, unless someone came on the market, invented the holy grail, and they would be rich overnight, would be a sealant you put in once, and it lasted the life of the tire. It healed, punctured uh, holes instantly, and uh, it, it sealed big holes instantly, and that would, that would be the death knell for tubes if that happened. Tubes, sorry, that's just my accent, tubes, sorry. Um, but, but yeah, that's... That's that one in a nutshell. Um, to step back to durometer uh, and, and rubber for a second, yeah, durometer is just the softness. So if, we, if we're talking at like a durometer number, um, it's, it's the hardness of the rubber. So a low number means really soft. A high number is, is really hard, you know, getting up to, and soft I would say is around that sort of, th really soft is around 30, really hard getting around 70, 80. That's, that's getting into pretty hard rubber. Um, there's a pretty big difference in the rolling performance of a, of a soft rubber versus a hard one, and you can think of it as a bouncy ball. Uh, if you drop a soft ball, it doesn't really bounce. If you drop a harder rubber ball, it, it bounces well. If you can visualize that in a tire, that's what we're dealing with. A soft rubber absorbs energy and doesn't rebound it very well, but it gives you fantastic grip. Um, so there is, again, there's no perfect durometer. There's only different durometers for different purposes. And to use that term, the holy grail again, it would be a really low durometer rubber that rolled really fast and didn't wear very quickly. But again, that's, um, it's, it's, it doesn't exist. So we're in this, this balancing act again. If I could add to that. Uh, on the contrary to uh, 
flat protection on top of the tire. I feel that unless you are deathly afraid of flats in that category, uh, just being a little bit above the, um, the, the foam filled tire category, um, I find that flat protection on top of the tire is, a, if tubeless is used properly, I feel that it's not needed. I feel on, 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 enduro, on enduro mountain biking, like stuff that you're, you know, like is just hucking yourself down a mountain and there's huge baby head boulders everywhere, then you might want to have a little bit of flat protection. But on anything else, if you're running tubeless, sidewalls are really where you're going to get the cuts. Um, slashes, you might get a slash on top of the tire, but it's pretty darn rare in the real world. So I feel that you're, there's a lot of trade-offs by having protection on top of the casing. You're giving up a lot of, uh, you're thickening the casing, so you're giving up a lot of that ride characteristic that you're looking for and the tread molding to the ground just perfectly and everything like that. And what's great about that latex sealant is, yeah, you get a little, you know, as long as it's nothing too, too big, you get, any, and if you have like a Dyna plug with you, you might be able to get out of there anyway. But, you know, as long as you're, you know, running fresh sealant, and I just recommend checking that sealant often, you know, take the tire off, take, you know, every few months, especially if you're living in the desert, which isn't a factor around here. But, you know, keep on putting fresh sealant in there, making sure it's not dry. And as long as you're doing that, you should be pretty good. Now, inevitably, you're always going to get a slice on top, but, you know, let's just pick a better line. Kind of the next thing we'll kind of talk about is just uh, tread design and like where we come from on that. Um, I, I think the easiest way to kind of look at when a manufacturer is looking to design a new tire or what, are the, like, what is the purpose of that, again, is just to kind of look at uh, what, what we think the terrain is going to be like. Um, you know, in a wetter situation, you know, you, you want a, a wider lug. Uh, it's more space that so has room for mud and things like that. But then again, is you know the angles of like what that tire is going to be riding at. Um, you know, we'll talk about siping later. Uh, but you know, again, it's pretty. You know, you can kind of look at a tire and kind of look at like what is the characteristics like that this thing would uh, would work best under. And you know, anywhere from like that smooth tread, file tread, all the way up to the big knobbies. So. Um, we can talk about siding next, but do you want to add to Yeah. Uh, uh, tread in and of itself, I'll, I'll share a little uh, anecdote I have from the R&D department at, at Schwalbein. It's uh, maybe a surprising one. Um, people always ask, what's important in terms of tread design? And we say, well, obviously, what's important in terms of tread design is what the market's going to accept and what's going to sell tyres. I mean, we're a business. Everyone's a business here uh, in terms of the bike industry. Um, so I asked, asked one of our engineers, how important do you think that is? And they said, really, we would like to think that the performance of a tread is by far the most important thing. But in reality, any uh, you know, think tanks they do and, and, and questioning people about a tyre when we show pictures of it, actually about 50% of it is just the aesthetics of a tyre. So it's kind of depressing, yes, I'll admit, but uh, you know, Certainly if a tyre looks good, it sells well. Fortunately, if they look good, generally they, they work pretty well. <laughs> there is a pretty big overlap there. Um, in terms of what works and what doesn't for tread, when you go to a bigger tyre, tread actually becomes less and less important. So if you're going up to a fat bike, for instance, and you're riding on trails, the actual tread on the tyre is uh, only really important if you're, if you're sort of dealing with loose conditions where it has to dig in. But the tyre makes its own tread for the most part. It conforms around uh, things on the trail or on gravel. So for us, we find, particularly in gravel, because I feel like probably a lot of people here, that's what they want to talk about and hear about, um, you can get away with a lot, less, uh, a lot less tread when you go to a bigger tyre and run lower pressure. So uh, you know, every brand will, will do sort of different tread designs. A lot of them work really well, some of them work more or less well, depending on the type of gravel you're talking about. Everyone knows that the dirty cans are race where it's brutal, volcanic, cut your tires open kind of rock. Um, and, you know, I, I run sponsorship at Schwalbe as well, so I put athletes on a lot of different stuff for testing in, in that, that race. And what I've come to find is uh, tread, the actual tread pattern doesn't make too much difference beyond a certain point. 
what Ronnie was talking about, and that's you know, the ride quality and that puncture protection uh, in that instance is much more important than sidewall protection. So tread is very high on a lot of people's uh, list when they're looking at buying tires. Is it as important as, as most people think? In all honesty, not, not really. Um, mountain biking, yes. If you're talking about riding in loam, and sand, uh, mud, tread is extremely important. Outside of that, if you're talking about riding on the road, a lot of uh, tread designs are, are essentially, I wouldn't call them marketing gimmicks, but they differentiate tires. On a dry road, slicks are just, just best, or very close to slicks, essentially. So. You want to talk about what on the tread? Um, uh, you have, uh, uh, essentially, we have uh, three different things. We have uh, uh, something in the, we have the center knobs, we have the cornering capabilities on the side knobs, and then we have um, uh, what works best in wet weather. Uh, so why would I want something with a little bit of uh, braking traction, for example? Uh, on dirt, what would work best, what kind of center knobs would work best for something that would still roll fast but give me braking traction? That will depend entirely on the substrate that you're riding on. So that, that's the difficult one. I, I, you know, don't get me wrong, I don't want to play down the importance of tread, but uh, it, it's very, very condition dependent. So if you're riding on dirt, let's call it loam, I'll, uh, I'll bro out a little bit and call it loam, um, the knobs are quite important in terms of braking and cornering and things like that. The tyre has to bite into the ground. Um, if, you, if you're talking about a very stable substrate, for instance, hard pack gravel, asphalt, uh, hard pack, whatever the blue groove do we call it at uh, bike parks and stuff like that. Yeah, the tread actually can, in quite a few instances, degrade grip, the grip characteristics of tyres in a few, you know, you get taller knobs, they fold, you get some weird sort of handling issues with your bike. So I guess in a nutshell, the, hard, the harder you go and the more grip you have in, in a surface, so hard pack, nice gravel, um, tread can actually be a bit of a disadvantage. The softer you get, if you're talking about riding in mud, tread is everything. So it's very dependent. Uh, and again, I guess the take home message, if there's any here today is there is no perfect tire. There's only the perfect tire for the conditions on the day and for the rider and for the bike. So that's, that's always what I like to tell people. It's, it's very dependent on what you're doing and what you want. And that's what makes tires so fascinating, right? Uh, moving forward on, uh, if we're talking about, score, you want to talk about siping, yes, we're talking about, uh, this kind of ties into what the knobs do and how you can change the characteristics of what the knobs do. You want to? Yeah. So something that's kind of fun when you're looking at all the different manufacturers of how they make a tire and what, what the tread does is to kind of remind, like go back to thinking about like the drive side of the, the log, which is, tends to be to the front, and then you have like the braking side on the back. So again, kind of going to what is the best tire that's going to have a good, it's going to be a good braking tire, is it going to be that one with that you know, the bar basically down the like across the tire there. Um, but as you look at different tires and how they worked front down the center and worked their way out, you'll kind of, uh, you can kind of see how the tire was designed for acceleration, cornering, and all that kind of things. Something else to kind of play with is uh, the siping within the tire because that will give you a, you know, more of that braking edge or that traction edge. So it, it just doubles the, the surface area of that tire. So that's always kind of a fun thing to kind of play with and, and look at of how that tire was designed and how much traction you're gonna actually get within the lug with, with, without losing the structure of the actual lug. To, to be clear, when we're talking about siping, we're talking about the, if you've ever no, wondered what all those lines and everything are in the middle of the, your tire lugs, that's called siping. That's how. That's a takeaway you can really, you know, any of your friends at home, if they're not, you know, you, you'll sound more tech savvy than they are. Go up to their tires and be like, hey, nice siping, that's pretty cool. Is that for accelerating or cornering? All right, write that one down. And, and you can kind of see if you look at, you know, the, like the second one to the left, you know, where the siping is designed for, you know, that 
more turning side, whereas the far left, the siping is you know across, which is that braking and acceleration one there. So. Yeah, I don't have too much to add to that. Uh, you know, from a tire construction and R&D standpoint, siping is a really difficult thing to actually get perfect. Um, our R&D department spends a lot of time trying different kinds of siping and working on it, and it does have, I would call it very nuanced differences in uh, how it affects the handling of a tire, but mostly at the limit, um, and mostly in very specific sorts of conditions. Slippery conditions, um, the best example of slippery conditions and how siping works is the winter tires on your car or your truck. Basically it just gives more biting edge to the rubber while allowing the tread blocks to maintain stability. Um, so it's essentially like having a tire with a thousand tiny little biting edges um, but with the benefits of having you know, big knobs that support you in uh, loose conditions. So um, just trust us that it works really well and every tire manufacturer that's got siping it's, it is there for a good reason. Um, some manufacturers understand how it works better than others, uh, but uh, yeah, for the most part, it, it's generally a good thing. It, it won't make your tires degrade more quickly. Um, and when they're new, everyone that's ridden tires from the last four or five years will tell you how much nicer it is than the 90s when none of that's, that, that existed really. So we're in a good place with tires right now. Good tire talk. <laughs> And uh, lastly, we're going to do, we're just going to talk uh, briefly about tire pressure before we open up a few uh, questions from the audience. Um, so, as you can see up here, I'm going to, we have some great uh, examples of what it looks like when your tire is over, proper, and under adjusted. So, I'll put it over. Yeah, so just, just to kind of quickly go over this. Uh, Every tire has a tire range that we recommend uh, and how that tire was designed. So if you look at proper, uh, the tire was designed to have a rolling spot, you know, a driving area, and then the rollover of like when you're at a certain angle. So I think a lot of our tires are kind of designed at like that 20 to 25 degree uh, turn. And so with proper tire pressure, you're allowing that transition to, you know, the straightaway to the the, the cornering knobs and how that's designed. Um, when you over inflate, all you do is you really just sit really tight on that center channel and it's just going to be harder to, to do the transition and the traction that that tire was designed for. And then on the other end, you know, if you're over inflating, you're just, you're, the biggest thing you're going to see is you're not going to have any structure to the tire, but you're also not going to be riding the lugs like they were designed. So. Okay, I've been excited to talk about this one because it's my, it's my pet peeve and my, my uh, little hobby to dork out on, on tire pressure. So I'm going to give three scenarios here since we have three pictures. Uh, in the first here we have a tire, this tire, and you're all imagining this one on the left is at 20 psi and the one in the middle is at 40 psi and the, and the one at the left is at 60, let's just say. I'm going to give you another scenario that this tire on the right is a 300 pound person, the one in the middle is a 200 pound person, and the one on the, on the left here is a 120 pound person, and all those tires are inflated to the exact same pressure. So this is, this is the, the big one for me, and I talk to uh, consumers and dealers about it all the time. If you're talking about the pressure that's listed on the side of your tire, and let's say for a 700 by 35 C tire, it's a 50 to 85 PSI. The 85 PSI is not a target. Just because it's higher does not mean it's better. If we were to test a tire and, and say it has a load holding capability of say uh, 200 pounds per tire, two tires on a bike, the, the bike is good for 400 pounds of load. That's really the only time that you would want to inflate that tire to 85 PSI. Uh, if you are a person that doesn't weigh that 400 pounds, let's say you're 150 and you inflate to 85 psi, you're going to have a lot of follow-on negative effects. The first and, and what obviously the audience here sort of agreed was pretty important, you do increase your risk of punctures from foreign objects pretty drastically. And that's essentially because the tyre is exerting more force on a smaller area on the ground, so sharp objects push through the casing more easily. The other thing you do is massively increase the wear rate of the tyre. So uh, for us, um, a tyre, just to give you a comparison, 
A tyre that should last six to 8,000 miles, you can get, just by inflating it to the maximum, if you're a lightweight person, you can get it to halve that down to 4,000 or less miles. Um, so probably less important, um, well, not less important, but those, to me, they're, they're the two main things. You also destroy the ride quality and you destroy the grip. Um, it's just not a good time all around. So tire pressure, the high, higher is not better. So um, we've had a sea change in the industry as far as what tire pressure means to, to different people and performance. And Tubeless has changed the game a lot where, and it's not just Tubeless, it's also materials engineering technology and uh, rubber compounding and chemistry that lower pressures don't mean slower anymore like they did once upon a time. So when you take out the tube, you remove a, a large portion of uh, a loss of efficiency. So that's one thing. And secondarily, the chemistry in rubber now is, is pretty efficient. What I was talking about earlier with flexing that rubber backwards and forwards, a tire at low pressure, there's a lot of flexing going on. A tire at high pressure, it's not flexing. So now with new compounding technology in rubber, you can flex that tire backwards and forwards a lot and you're not losing anywhere near as much energy. So what was maybe the appropriate pressure to run in a tire 10 years ago for optimal rolling performance and a good balance, that in reality that's dropped and it's dropped across the industry. So I mean we're talking about, I'll give you a, a, an idea of what, we, what we're running at, at pro tour level. So 20C, 23C tires disappearing from road, 25s taking over and now 28s are really the go-to for pro teams. They're running 60 psi in those tires, and that's down from, you know, what Ronnie was talking about earlier with 20s at 165 psi and things like that, and lower rolling resistance by a huge amount than what people were running with that that 165 psi. So, um, horses for courses. If you're a big person, pump it up. If you're a small person, leave it nice and soft. Yeah, that's uh, tire pressure is something that you can change on your bike right now that will improve the performance. Most people in this room, I can guarantee it, are probably running 10, 5 to 10 PSI too much. Uh, run your front tire a little bit lower, about 5 PSI lower than your rear. It's, you're not sitting on your front tire like you are on the rear, and you, you rely on the rear a lot for braking traction, cornering, and cush from the you know, road vibrations and bumps from the rocks and roots that you're riding over. And yeah, I like to go around and just squeeze tires just because I like touching tires first off of a tire fetishist. Uh, and I'll, I'll go around and test everybody, you know, and, and I like to feel where people are running. And no matter what, I always feel people are just too cautious with that, you know, whether it's shell shock left over from running tubes and getting pinch flats, uh, or if it's just um, misinformation where you just see a number on the sidewall and you pump up to that number. Uh, that's how we used to do it and because uh, it was always thought that you would either get a pinch flat or it just wasn't as fast. But now with tubeless technology and where we are with uh, rim widths, which we won't get into, uh, you're able to run these much lower tire pressures. For me, on a, with my with 650 by fi, uh, 48 to 50, I'm running 20 front, 25 rear, like wicked low. You don't need a lot of air in there. You'd be really surprised, and it really, really dramatically improves uh, traction and your ride quality. Um, so uh, let's open it up. We got anybody who has uh, any questions? Right back there. You mentioned uh, nitrogen a little bit or in the very beginning, and I'd just like to hear what your thoughts are on using nitrogen as opposed to just standard air. Sure. Um, I mean, there's a couple of things to, to sort of know about uh, what you're dealing with when you're inflating your bicycle tires. And the first is if you're in, just inflating with a floor pump, you're getting about 80% nitrogen anyway. Nitrogen is relatively, uh, it, it doesn't leach through the rubber easily. So every time you inflate your tires with a floor pump, the percentage of nitrogen is getting up. Uh, much, much higher because the oxygen and the carbon dioxide, which are the main secondary other components of air, they uh, leach through the rubber much more quickly. Um, ideally, yes, you would inflate with, with pure nitrogen. Is there a performance advantage to doing so? 
Not really. Nitrogen is super stable at high temperatures, which is great if you're, uh, you know, you like to drive your Formula One car really fast and they're getting up to a couple of hundred degrees in a bicycle. That, stabi that temperature stability is even, you know, descending on a rim brake road bike. It's, it, it's honestly neither, neither here nor there. The only thing that nitrogen will give you right off the bat is your tyre pressure will hold more evenly straight away. So if you're inflating with a floor pump, you will notice over time that, that your tyres do tend to hold air better over time. Um, so yeah, if you've got, if you got a nitrogen bottle at home or in your bike shop, by all means, is there any real reason to? Not, not really. That was a real nerdy question, though. Thank you. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. Right here. Um, uh, most road tires uh, list a, a inflation pressure range at a low range. Do you need to be at the low range, or can you go below that? I sometimes run below that. Uh, uh, you're my kind of guy. Yeah. yeah. I, I always go below. Um, that's not a technical answer. I just, you know. I think that uh, uh, you guys can correct me, correct me if I'm wrong, but they're talking with tube always. And you don't want to, it's uh, not necessarily, I mean, you are kind of beefing up your sidewall a little bit when you put a tube in there, so it's not going to squirm as much. But I like to always say that they just don't recommend you run anything lower than that for just denting your rim or something. Is that yeah, is that the standard? <laughs> yeah, essentially that, that's so the, the low range that we would use is um, it's, pr it's a practical low range. I mean, most people, even heavier people, could run that low range, and there's not too much danger of pinching a rim. Um, getting below the, the, the lowest range that we would list on the side of a tyre, uh, you can run into a couple of problems. And what, the biggest problem you would run into is a specific combination of a narrow rim and a wide tyre. So when you drop that pressure low, uh, on a narrow rim, you start to get a lot of tire instability. So at the low pressure, it gives you some really weird handling issues if you corner hard, and you'll feel that as squirm, and most people aren't really sure what they're feeling. It just feels unsure. So mid-corner, you might have to adjust a line if you're on your road bike. Um, it does really weird stuff on gravel as well. The knobs don't work quite the way they should because the tire's not flexing the way it should. Um, so for the most part, yeah, definitely, by all means, go lower. If you have, uh, if, if it's not feeling squirmy, you are maybe increasing the risk of if you hit, say, a pothole or something, maybe you would pinch the tire and damage the rim. If you don't have three and a half thousand dollar carbon rims, uh, who, who cares? Go low. <laughs> That's good. Back there. Let me start and I'll pass it yeah, you're, right you're, you're right away. Okay. I'm, I'm excited on this one, and I'm actually this is this is a plug to, to WTB because um, you know respect here is that WTB makes a brilliant rim and, and tire combination. So the number one thing in terms of rim and rim and tire combination is that they work together. We've had a real lack of uh, standards in the industry. The trick with tubeless is that stuff needs to work together. Um, as the, the big troubleshooter guy at Schwalbe, I can tell you I keep spreadsheets of issues that people have. And the number one, and I mean the number one, and I can't overstate this enough with tubeless, is rim tape. 100% rim tape is the devil. And if your rim tape isn't in perfect shape, seating a tubeless tire can be an absolute nightmare. So I would go as far to say that statistically speaking, and I have this as a stat, because like I say, I keep Excel spreadsheets on dorky stuff, 90% of seating issues can be resolved with either a change of rim tape or the correct rim tape for the rim. But anyway, I'll pass over to you for that one. Yeah, so the rim tape is a big one, um, you know, proper, like proper install. Um, the other thing is like a, a, a true tire 
size, like if you know if it is an accurate, um, you know, and not a sloppy thing. I know that we like we follow ERTR standard, and so what you will get is you'll get a really tight seal within that. So um, the the sloppier, the looser that uh, that combination of tire to rim is, it's going to be a lot harder to do with a floor pump or um, you know on the road. Um, but if you do have a nice tight seal within that, um, you know, a lot of times you can just do that with a, a floor pump because you can move it around. So it's, it's the tire rim combination that's really uh, loose and sloppy. That is like, that's where it's gonna get hard. But in the meantime, you know, the compressor, the compressor game is probably where you're at right now. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, just a little, a little more on that. In terms of where tubeless technology is, what you've got to hope for, with, with installation. Uh, it's improved drastically um, in the last year and a half to the point where um, I'd, I'd make a bet with anyone in this room I can get a tubeless tire on a rim and set up quicker than with a tube without taking the valve core out and with a floor pump. That's, that's where we're at. That's not a, not a unhumble brag. The, the technology has come along such a way that with a good wheel um, and, and a tire that's designed to do so, it seriously put it on and pump it up, no fuss, no muss, just, and hopefully that's where everything's gonna end up. The, the ETRTO has updated their standards for road tubeless, so that's not um, a big black mark against anyone anymore. There is proper standards. They're gonna be implemented across the industry uh, and it, it will make life a lot easier. Getting back to the real issue with, with tubeless, I mean, ultimately, if you have a real problem, just put a tube in. It's not a big deal with, uh, with it if you get a big flat on the side of the road. But. For touring, that's my, if, I, if, the, if the tire doesn't go on well the first time when I'm doing it at home or in the shop, then I'm like, okay, I gotta bring a tube. And oftentimes, uh, a trick is you could inflate the tube inside the tire and that'll seat one half of the bead at least. And then maybe with your frame pump, you can get the other half on. But yeah, it is still a problem with long distance touring, especially on plus bikes, because you're having to shoot a lot of air in there to get it to seat. So yeah, you still got to bring a tube. Over there. Um, yeah, with, uh, so my, uh, my best friend and I just started a tire company. We launched two, three months ago, Ultra Dynamico. And we, uh, our tires are made by Panaracer in Japan. Um, we design the treads and the compounds and the, we decide what casings we want and if we want protection or uh, things like that. And they have a, a it, it's seemingly infinite what you can do with a tire. Uh, which is really, really cool, and, and especially when they were excited to work with us. Uh, and so um, to start the tire company was just something that, uh, tires have been something that I've just been into uh, since the very beginning with me and bikes. Uh, so as a, you know, a, 13, a 12 or 13 year old, I was just obsessed with tires and I still am to this day. And so, uh, yeah, it was just something that I always wanted to have uh, in the product lineup. Uh, but the, the tire molds are $13,000 each uh, with Panaracer. And so it's a huge startup and I just never had the money for it. Uh, my friend Patrick had some stock in Amgen, which is what supplied Lance Armstrong with EPO. And, uh, and so he cashed it and we started a tire company. So if you buy Ultra Dynamico, you are supporting drugs and cycling. <laughs> When it was still good, right? <laughs> uh, so yeah, that was the, uh, the startup money was what we needed with that. And uh, tires are a great business to be in because they wear out. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and so, um, and it's a lot, a lot of fun. Uh, a lot of fun talking about tires. That's why we're up here right now. Uh, so I hope that answers the question. <laughs> That's true. I, I, the studded tires, I did a winter in Durango uh, 
training for road racing and it was like a glacial season. Sometimes it's totally sunny and dry all year long, but it was like the entire town was covered in a glacier for like four months. And yeah, without those studded tires, I was, it really is. I was, that was the only time I've ever effectively used them. And I don't know what I would have done. I, I, first ride I went out on, I had like three bruises on my ass and then switched over to studs and no more bruising. <laughs> Oh, sorry. How much are these pro, uh, tour riders weighing that can do 60 pounds on a 28C? <laughs> well, you, I know. <laughs> I'm not even going to talk about that. Yeah, you just said about EPO, but um, <laughs> they're not crazy light dudes that are running that sort of pressure, like 160 pounds. Okay. Yeah. Like yeah. 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 Um, on the 28. Rim width is a large part of this as well, so the ETRTO, which uh, we've used that acronym a couple of times, it's the European Tire and Rim Technical Organization, they sort of set standards for, um, for rims and tires, and a lot of those standards have been taken up over the years by the ISO, International Standards. Um, so in the past, really narrow rims, the 13 millimeter wide rim was sort of the go-to when we were talking 20 to 23C, and it moved up to sort of 15 millimeter wide rims when we're 23s and 25s, um, and then sort of 17s dabbled around a while. The, the new standard we're sitting at is a 19 millimeter rim for, for modern tubeless, and that's the, the newer 2019 standard. So what I was talking about with the squirminess of tires and, and going to those low pressures, it really is dependent on the sort of new, the new, newer technologies, newer rims that have the width to not be super squirmy at the low pressures. Uh, and that's tubeless we're talking about. Still people using tubulars at pro tour level would be running a little bit more pressure uh, than that. Not much, honestly. They're running pretty darn low these days as well. Um, yeah, g give it a shot. At the point where your tyre starts to get squirmy, that's where you need a little bit more pressure. At the point where you, your carbon rim snaps in half because you hit a pothole, that's when you need a bit more pressure. <laughs> that's uh, the yeah. indicator. So. <laughs> All right, with that, I'm sorry, we can't take any more questions. We've got to wrap it up. I know, I know tires are the most interesting thing in the world. Tell your spouse that. Uh, <laughs> thank you all for coming out. And thank Nathan and Andrew for coming up and, and uh, being so knowledgeable. That was a lot of fun. Thanks, everybody.